Okay, so welcome along, ladies and gentlemen, uh, to your weekly SETI seminar series. Today we're very fortunate to be joined by Brian Cantwell, who's come across to us from Stanford. Uh, and uh, Brian did a uh, BA and BS at uh, Notre Dame uh, uh, before, uh, or, or and upon graduation, went to Johnson Space Center uh, to work on the Apollo uh, LEM ascent engine from the moon. Um, <clears throat> And uh, then after that experience, he spent two years uh, in Belgium with the US Army. Uh, and then on completion of his service, I uh, went to Caltech for his master's and his PhD. Uh, in 1978, he joined the Stanford faculty where he's been ever since. Uh, and he was uh, department chair at engineering from uh, 2001 to 2008. And uh, Brian is a fellow of the American Physical Society. Uh, the AIAA and uh, the Royal Aeronautical Society. Uh, Brian's research uh, revolves around uh, similarity methods uh, to investigate uh, space-time structure of turbulent flows. Since 1998, he's been working on uh, models of flowing oxidizers and uh, liquid droplets of fuel, uh, which has led to uh, research that he's going to tell us about on hybrid motors, hybrid engines, um, and... Uh, uh, Brian is also uh, interested in uh, developing ascent vehicles from Mars, uh, as uh, he's mentioned to me uh, just before. So uh, that's our planetary planetary link there. So if you'll join me in welcoming Brian. Um, thank you, Adrian, for the introduction. That's very nice. I appreciate that. And thanks for the invitation to come and speak today. Uh, well, you mentioned that I worked at the Manned Spacecraft Center in 1968, working on the LEM ASEN engine. And that was really my first encounter with real rocket propulsion. And I uh, had an interesting job. I was, I'd come out of undergraduate school and was headed off to Caltech and uh, worked there in the thermochemical test area. Uh, and at the time, you remember, this was before the landing on the moon, uh, and they were trying to develop uh, this engine to get off the moon, which was a widely throttleable hydrazine N2O4 nitrogen tetroxide hypergolic rocket motor, which I think was made by, uh, my memory serves, TRW or Bell, I can't remember. But they were unsatisfied with the work they're getting out of white sands. It was too slow, and so they decided they needed to have a actual test facility at the Manned Spacecraft Center, which is in Clear Lake, not too far from Houston. So that was kind of unusual, just to put a rocket test stand there. And I got there as a summer intern, and they gave me two jobs. My first job was, uh, these were connected to the testing. The first job was to stand out in this open field when the rocket motor would fire with a sound pressure level meter in my hand and measure sound pressure level contours outside the area where the rocket was firing. So I'd be standing there with uh, you know, 160 decibels registering on my meter and my whole body sort of shaking. And then I have to move from there to another point and ultimately over the course of the testing trace out contours because they were worried about complaints from the neighbors, the neighbors around the center of the noise. And then the other job I had was to chase clouds of nitrogen tetroxide. Now, I don't know how many people here have ever had any experience with rocket oxidizers, but N2O4 is one of the, uh, the nastier ones. And every once in a while, they would have to vent this stuff, and they would simply do that. They would just vent it out the top of this rocket facility where they were testing. N2O4 is, it turns red when it uh, drops to atmospheric pressure. And uh, it's fairly heavy, so it turns red, and then it kind of this red cloud that drifts away from the rocket test stand, which wasn't that far from the center, actually. In fact, you could drive in front of the Manned Spacecraft Center in those days and every once in a while see a cloud of red N2O4 going across the road. So my job was to chase this stuff and watch it, and if it got off the center, I was to call so they could get the fire department out to keep people inside. <laughs> 
<laughs> so that was their idea of environmentally friendly rocket testing at the Advanced Space Guy Center. The truth is that the center in those days was surrounded entirely by rocket people, by engineers, NASA engineers who were involved in the program to go to the moon. And a little bit of N204 drifting down the street didn't bother them at all. They just felt a little bit more connected to the whole program. <laughs> so, well, today I want to talk about some work that really got started in the late 1990s. I uh, was uh, working with a very good uh, graduate student, a uh, fellow by the name of Arif, who is pictured here. And I think I'll, since there's two of these, I'm going to try to use the pointer. So uh, this fellow right here is, is Arif and came from Istanbul. We get a lot of very good <laughs> students who come from other countries, come to Stanford, and Arif was one of, maybe the best student I've ever had. And he got me interested, or re-interested in rocket propulsion, and was working on hybrid rockets, which are sort of an interesting version of rocket propulsion, which uh, people had been looking at for a long time, because they have certain features that make them uh, basically safer than other systems. Uh, the other person I've worked with quite a bit is Greg Ziliak, who's pictured here. Greg is a research engineer, research scientist at NASA Ames, and has been working with us over the years on a lot of our research on hybrid rockets. I think a lot of you probably know Scott Hubbard. Scott joined Stanford while I was department chair and has been working with my, my group as we've gotten into problems related to uh, planetary exploration. And the other pictures here are the students. Uh, who work on this aspect of the research. This is Ashley Mix, who works on nitrogen tetro nitro nitrous oxide decomposition. Ben Waxman works on the fluid mechanics of injectors. Beth Jens, who comes from Torquay, which is near Geelong. Adrian, you probably know that area. Uh, and she came from the University of Melbourne to Stanford. Um, Ashley Chandler, some of her work, uh, some of the most current stuff we're doing, and then Jonah Zimmerman, who uh, uh, is interested in the dynamics of uh, uh, critical liquids expelling from tanks. So how did we, what are, what are hybrids all about? Well, he, this is a classic picture of the space shuttle. Everybody's seen this, and you all know that the shuttle is a, it's a, it's a wonderful example of the two basic types of rocket propulsion. You have the shuttle main engines burning liquid oxygen, liquid hydrogen. Uh, producing thrust, uh, very complex machinery and plumbing, about as complicated a set of machinery as you'd ever imagine. Um, they can be throttled, although not very much. Uh, the design in the shuttle uh, engines was, in fact, a large part of the cost was involved in learning how to, to uh, throttle these engines so they could be throttled back during the period when the shuttle goes through max Q. Um, then there's the solids on the side. Solids are mechanically very simple. It's basically a big, long tube filled with a low-grade explosive. Uh, in this case, it's uh, ammonia perchlorate, which is the primary oxidizer. And then the actual primary fuel is aluminum, uh, which is embedded in a P-band binder. Um, the problem with perchlorates, I don't know how many of you have followed this at all, but uh, there's a whole series of cleanups going on around California, particularly up here in the hills near San Jose, where there used to be a, a, a rocket facility of CSD. Uh, people worry about perchlorates getting into the groundwater and ultimately getting into our drinking water and ultimately causing hypothyroidism. And there's now pretty good evidence that there's a link between perchlorates and hypothyroidism, in, in the, particularly in women. Um, so there's, uh, there are environmental issues with solids. The truth is that worldwide, if you look at the rate of failure of rocket launches, it's a couple of percent. And I don't know of any other industry uh, that accepts that sort of rate of failure uh, other than the rocket launch industry. And in fact, most of those failures are propulsion-related failures. Well, <coughs> there are alternatives. Uh, why do those failures occur? Well, they, they occur for a whole variety of different reasons. They partly involve the complexity probably involve the explosion hazard. Uh, solid rockets, propellants have to be uh, cast. If there's cracks, defects in the grain, uh, they can uh, cause problems. The hybrid, uh, which has been around a long time as a concept, uh, is sort of in between these two other designs. But it's not in between in the sense of its 
the way it uh, behaves, the way it performs, and the way you analyze it. It's basically a liquid oxidizer. There's a uh, combustion chamber, and inside the combustion chamber is the fuel. So you have a solid fuel cast inside the combustion chamber. It's a fuel only, so it's not a propellant like in a solid rocket. It can't ex explode. Uh, you create um, you uh, create combustion over the surface of the fuel. There's a flame. The flame evaporates the fuel. It mixes with the oxidizer and produces thrust. The oxidizer can be controlled, so the thrust can be controlled. Hybrids can be turned off and turned on. Uh, they have many of the features of liquids in the sense that they can be throttled. They only require one liquid feed system, which is good. Uh, and their performance in terms of specific impulse and other measures of performance are really uh, comparable to liquid rockets. So it's an oxidizer, which is a very energetic oxidizer like LOX, burning with, uh, say, a hydrocarbon fuel. In contrast to solid rockets where you have something like ammonia perchlorate, uh, which is not a terribly energetic oxidizer compared to oxygen. Uh, but it's dense, so solid rockets have their advantages in terms of propellant density liquids in terms of the uh, specific impulse, or if you, a better measure really is the exhaust velocity produced by the propellants. Uh, the uh, hybrid is comparable to liquids in that sense. Well, because the, sol the fuel is in solid form, it's very difficult to get a catastrophic explosion with a hybrid rocket. Uh, if I have time, I'll try to show you an explosion or two. Uh, but the explosions that do occur tend to be relatively benign compared to typical rocket explosions, which involve perhaps mixing of the fuel and oxidizer in what might be a vapor and an explosion that could take out not just the vehicle but the launch stand as well. So hybrids have this sort of inherently safe uh, feature to them. They're mechanically simple and presumably would offer lower life cycle costs compared to the other systems. The way the combustion works is kind of illustrated here. It's basically a diffusion flame over the solid surface of the fuel and as the fuel burns away, uh, it uh, evaporates and the fuel that's uh, produced uh, mixes with the oxidizer and produces hot gases and thrust. The regression rate here is the measure of fuel burning rate. The regression rate for a hybrid is proportional to the oxidizer mass flux. So this is an interesting feature of hybrids compared to solid rockets. In a solid rocket, you also talk about the propellant regression rate, uh, but it's a function of the chamber pressure. Higher chamber pressure, higher regression rate. In a hybrid, the regression rate is virtually independent of the chamber pressure. It depends on the oxidizer flux. And so hybrids, for, again, are less susceptible to uh, the kind of instability that in a solid could lead to explosion. And moreover, for a designer, it means that the chamber pressure is a free parameter that can be designed for the particular mission of interest. Um, so oxidizer flux. Now, when it comes to the actual rate at which that solid surface regresses, in a solid rocket, a, a reasonable number would be, say, uh, a centimeter a second. So if I had a large solid rocket, three meters in diameter, with a one meter port, I've got a one meter web, that'll burn out in about 100 seconds. So that's kind of a reasonable measure of a large solid. For the hybrid, the regression rate is much smaller, maybe a tenth or less than that. So this is the problem. Hybrids have been around a long time, but when it comes to the regression rate, it tends to be very low. When it comes to producing high rates of gas flow and thrust, they tend to be kind of anemic, kind of wimpy. Well, the history has actually goes back to 1933. In fact, the first hybrid ever flown was the first uh, bipropellant rocket flown by the Soviet Union. It was the GERD-9 by Tikhronov, who uh, basically flew this thing to about 1,500 meters. It used uh, gelled gasoline as a solid fuel. And over the years, there's been a whole series of efforts to try to make the hybrid sort of work. Uh, people recognized the throttleability and the sort of safety aspects pretty early on. And uh, you can see the variety of fuels people use. They have coal, uh, uh, Douglas fir, wood, is a pretty good fuel. Uh, down here at CSD, they did a lot of work on hybrids. They once 
did a demonstration using a salami as the fuel. <laughs> so, that's too powerful. And in fact, in fact, they had a proposal to NASA to actually use some of the solid waste on board spacecraft to generate energy from the solid using using a hybrid concept. Uh, the the GE investigation is an interesting one. They were actually interested in a uh, monopropellant thruster using hydrogen peroxide, and then they said, well, let's add a little polyethylene at the end and just get a little bit more performance. And so they did one of the earliest studies of a hybrid, more or less uh, by accident, just kind of looking for a way to improve what they were doing. More recently, uh, there's been a lot of research. Chemical Systems Division United Technologies down here in San Jose, which is now Pratt Whitney and I think is getting ready to be closed, <clears throat> did a lot of work on hybrids. And this picture here depicts a lithium lithium hydride P band, solid. Ben as a, a polymer binder, burning with fluorine and oxygen, flux, getting a specific impulse of 480 seconds, which is 130 seconds greater than the hydrogen-oxygen engines for the space shuttle. So very high performance, but pretty nasty stuff. Um, and there were um, a number of target drones developed, and they were <laughs> good applications of hybrids because they burn for a long time. So you could fly a target drone for a long period of time and actually utilize the low regression rate of a typical polymeric fuel. More recently, there was an uh, underwater launch of something called the Dolphin. Uh, AMROC uh, was a company actually developed to, cr to really uh, uh, bring the technology of hybrids to market, which they never did. They finally went bankrupt. Probably the most famous application was Spaceship One, which won the X Prize some, some years ago, which you see here. That was a hybrid rocket burning nitrous oxide with HTPB, hydroxyl terminated polybutadiene, which is a polymer and is a, a common binder. Well, what's the problem with hybrids? They've been around a long time. They've never really been commercialized. Spaceship One is an example of an application, but Spaceship One was never required to have much performance. All you need to do is get to 100 kilometers and come back. And high-performing rockets based on hybrids have actually never been commercialized. And the problem really is sort of illustrated here. You have this low burn rate, and along with the low burn rate, you have to do something to get enough gas to generate enough thrust to make these things work. And so people end up with what are called multi-port grains. So it's not enough to have just a single circular port. You have to have many of these ports. They're all burning. And of course, as they burn outward, they burn toward each other. The fuel grain eventually weakens and breaks, and you start expelling fuel. That's not good. Or they burn out to the, to the case. And as soon as one of these ports reaches the case, you have to shut down because you can't subject the case to the high temperature gases more than a few seconds before you get a burn through. So multi-port grains have always kept hybrids from being successful. And, but people have worked on them. And here's some examples. This is actually a Lockheed Martin design uh, not that long ago, 2006. They're trying to use 43 ports to generate a rocket that would uh, satisfy uh, an Air Force program called Falcon for a uh, long range, uh, long reach sort of uh, um, um, a weapon system of some sort. Uh, some of the pictures there from CSD's test, you can see they have these rather complicated designs. And you just can't burn all the fuel. So this really has sort of kept hybrids from being uh, reasonable and, and uh, commercially viable. Well, back in the 1990s, in the mid-90s, the Air Force uh, began working on what they called cryogenic hybrids. And the basic idea what they were really interested in was something like um, uh, liquid hydrogen burning with solid oxygen. So they had some concepts for very high performance hybrids where they were actually kind of a reverse hybrid with the oxygen as the solid. Well, they never really got very far with that. There was a little company up in Wisconsin that did a bit of work on very, very small scale thrusters based on this. But on the way to doing that research, the uh, Edwards Air Force Base uh, Research Group uh, looked at solid pentane. So their idea was to take, this was really a, in prep for, the, for the, the more high performance propellants, the idea was to take pentane, which is a liquid at room temperature, put it down in a liquid nitrogen bath and freeze it, 
and then run oxygen over it and burn it as a, as a hybrid where solid pentane was the fuel. They, they call them cryogenic hybrids. Well, one of the things they saw was a dramatic increase in the rate of burning with pentane over anything they'd seen before, three to five uh, fold increase in the regression rate. And they, they attributed this to the fact that since it was a cryogen, uh, it would have a lower heat of gasification, uh, it should therefore burn faster, and they could account for that uh, increase in reg regression rate, uh, that kind of an argument. The, the problem with that argument is that if you remember the picture of the flame over the solid surface, you can imagine that in an axisymmetric geometry. Now if you increase heat transfer to the surface and increase the evaporation rate off the surface, what happens is you increase the radial flux of mass and you in the process decrease the temperature gradient at the surface. So you sort of end up uh, mitigating a lot of the heat transfer because of that movement of the flame away from the surface and the lower temperature gradient. And this is called the blocking effect. And just simply increasing the heat transfer to the surface doesn't necessarily increase the regression rate in the way one would like. Well, this student, Arif, who I mentioned earlier, began to look at this carefully and he actually, they, they, they were kind enough to share their data with us and uh, he began to study the data and analyze it. And his conclusion was that what was happening with the pentane was that as it went from solid to gas, it went through a liquid phase with a very thin liquid sheet on the surface of the fuel. <coughs> and furthermore, when he studied the, the stability of that thin liquid sheet, he discovered that it was unstable with respect to what's called a long wave instability. That is, it's not like an ocean wave, which is pressure driven, but <coughs> you can get shear stress driven waves in a thin liquid sheet that cause the sheet to become unstable and you can get the instability to become nonlinear and you can begin to transfer heat or transfer fuel off the surface through quite literally a physical process of lifting the surface and drawing droplets away from it. So the picture that he came up with is initially this, you have this thin liquid sheet, it's maybe a hundred microns thick uh, it's uh, unstable to the shear stress associated with the oxidizer flow in the port. Uh, that instability becomes nonlinear, and you eventually have a picture that looks more like this. So you have with these flu flows li uh, fuels like pentane, where you have a very low viscosity liquid film, you can get this entrainment of droplets into the stream. So you have a kind of spray being drawn off the surface of the fuel. That dramatically increases the mass transfer rate. It, of course, increases the surface area for burning in a natural way and is not subject to the blocking effect that I talked about earlier. So this was the mechanism that Arif finally felt was at work, and this was a, much of the basis of his PhD thesis at Stanford. Um, in the course of doing this study, he recognized that the key thing was to recognize that the this entrainment mass transfer mechanism is proportional to the, is inversely proportional to the liquid layer viscosity and surface tension. Now the surface tension of these kinds of materials doesn't vary a lot from material to material, but the, the viscosity does. The viscosity of a, my pointer is not very effective here, the viscosity of something like HTPB, which is a common hybrid fuel, is four orders of magnitude higher than the viscosity of pentane when it liquefies. So the argument went something like this. First of all, you don't want to have to put your rocket into a liquid nitrogen bath before you launch. That's <laughs> not practical. <laughs> uh, far from it. You really need a material that's uh, solid at room temperature. And so a reef began a little bit of a, of a, uh, a detective study. And the study was to look at the melt temperatures for the alkanes. So what's shown up there are the normal alkanes. These are linear molecules, hydrocarbons. They're fully saturated hydrocarbons. So they're N carbons, uh, hydrogen above and below each one, and then two hydrogens at the ends. So these are the fully saturated normal alkanes. And if uh, pentane being uh, N equals five, uh, as you increase 
the molecular weight of this liquid as it's being produced, as a solid melts, there's a tendency for the viscosity of the liquid layer to go up. That's sort of working against you. However, when you look at increasing carbon numbers, you also find that the actual temperature of that liquid layer also goes up. And as we all know, the viscosity of a liquid goes down rapidly with temperature. And so when you look carefully, there's a kind of intermediate range of carbon numbers, molecular weight sort of in here, where the effect of increasing molecular weight on the viscosity is counterbalanced by the effect of the increasing temperature of the melt layer. So the bottom line is that for carbon numbers of around 30 or so to 45, uh, you actually can have this entrainment mechanism at work. If you go to very high carbon numbers and you get into the polyethylenes and things like that, the mechanism falls off because now you're increasing the molecular weight, but you're not increasing the melt layer temperature significantly. So if you get out into sort of this range and beyond, the entrainment mechanism that I just described turns off. So the bottom line was that there are, what do we call it? Well, the paraffin waxes right in here, turn out to be ideal for this application. In fact, the stability of a paraffin wax layer of a carbon number of about 32 or so is actually more unstable than the pentane. So these uh, paraffin-based fuels uh, really caught our interest. And as soon as we saw this, uh, Reef, who was actually studying hybrid stability, we kind of put that aside, made that one of the chapters of his thesis, and we went to look at this. And we started doing experiments with wax to see if we could see what he predicted to be a much higher regression rate comparable to what the Air Force was seeing with pentane or even higher. And indeed it worked. Um, we found that the waxes, in fact, the first couple of waxes he tried worked right away, right off the bat. And uh, we were getting this three to five factor in the regression rate. Now when you increase the regression rate by a factor of three to five, that's enough for a single port. And here's the way you can think of this. I said earlier that for a solid rocket, maybe one centimeter a second is, uh, uh, gives you enough gas generation rate to generate a lot of thrust. Now, of course, you're evaporating both oxidizer and fuel when you do that. In the hybrid, the oxidizer is already in vapor form. Now, the OF ratio for a hydrocarbon-based hybrid with LOX, let's say, is about two to two and a half. So two-thirds of the mass that you want to use to produce thrust is already in gas form. So you really need a regression rate, which is not a centimeter per second, like in the solid, but more like uh, three millimeters a second or a couple of millimeters a second. And then you have your mass generation rate that you need. So this factor of three to five completely changes the game in hybrids. It means now even a shuttle booster size hybrid can be built with a single circular port. So we've been working on this really since the late 1990s into 2000s. Uh, we've created a small company and in fact Arif is the president and CTO of a little company called Space Propulsion Group which is right in your area here actually over on Aliso off of Matilda. And uh, we've been basically commercializing this to larger and larger thrust levels. And I hope to be able to show you a couple of the videos later. Um, this particular design shows an 83% fuel loading compared to what might be 45 or 50% with a multiport grain. So there's a big difference in how much you can cram into a small volume, which is the name of the game in rockets. Rockets, you need high exhaust velocities and dense propellants. You need to get as much propellant into the volume available so that the mass ratio over the course of a burn is as large as possible. So we've been uh, studying these things since then. Now let me just say a couple words on the design. How do you design these things? This is a very sort of incomplete lesson, but uh, something to be aware of. If, so you have oxidizer flowing down the port. You have fuel being generated off the surface. Ideally, when you get to the end of the port, you'd like to have those things fully mixed at an oxidizer to fuel ratio, which is appropriate for high specific impulse, two and a half or whatever. Well, if you make the port too short, then you have oxidizer going out at the end and it's not gonna burn. That's bad. 
if you make the port too long, what happens is the oxidizer gets consumed, and then once it's consumed, you have hot gases generating fuel, but the fuel's got nothing to burn with, so you're ejecting fuel. So the port design comes down to understanding the rate at which this combustion layer grows in the port, and that becomes kind of a key feature. In fact, what you would like to be able to cover a wide range of missions is to be able to design the port <coughs> for structural purposes, for packing purposes, and then be able to tailor the regression rate to whatever design you come up with. And that's actually something these paraffin-based fuels allow you to do because what you've really got is a whole class of carbon numbers that you can mix with other materials and actually tailor the regression rate to a particular mission. So that's, uh, that's a little bit of what one worries about in the design. Well, we were doing these studies in the lab at Stanford on a thruster that would get about 50 pounds of thrust. Nobody would believe any of it. So we got our colleagues at NASA Ames to, uh, to put together a facility, and they got actually very interested in this problem because it's a really interesting fluid mechanics problem. And the fluid mechanics lab at, Stan at uh, NASA Ames has, has some really top-notch researchers. We started collaborating with them, and we built this uh, hybrid combustion facility, which sits out near the, uh, the Outdoor Aerodynamic Research Facility. If you've ever looked over at Ames or looked from the Baylands, you'll see this large yellow crane sitting out there toward the, toward the north end of the center. That's where we are out there. <coughs> this is the uh, oxidizer feed system. This is a test motor. And it kind of shows you the simplicity of the inside of the motor, but it's also a motor designed, I think, to withstand a nuclear bomb. It's uh, you know, way over-designed. Um, but this was our first test motor that we used out there and uh, did a lot of testing. And the purpose was to match against the testing we'd been doing at Stanford. We wanted to see if we scale this up, did these high regression rates that we were seeing still hold. And this is an image of one of the tests out there and kind of gives you a sense of sort of where we are looking south at the big hangar. Are you out there with your decibel meter again? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, we did do some noise studies along the, uh, uh, the Stevens Creek Trail that goes not too far from there to see whether it was too noisy. And we actually have the thing situated behind some uh, sort of large hay-filled <coughs> and sand-filled barriers to reduce the noise. Uh, if you're out there listening to it, it's, it's very noisy, as you might expect. But the, the tests last a few seconds, and they're typically they're over. This is a, what the pressure time looks like. Uh, you, the, you can see the ignition, the pressure rises, and then there's a period during which the pressure falls. And the pressure is falling really for two reasons. Partly, the, the nozzle is opening up a little bit. That causes some pressure decrease. But also, hybrids have a natural tendency for the pressure to go down over the course of a burn because you're increasing the surface area for burning. That means more fuel generated. But you're also decreasing the flux down the port. And so the exponent on the, on the mass flux for the regression rate law is usually greater than a half. If it was a half, there'd be no change in the fuel flow. If it's greater than a half, that means that the fuel generation rate goes down slightly over the course of the burn. And so that's what you're seeing uh, partially there. That regressive behavior of hybrids is a desirable property, generally. Generally, in, in solids, you have the surface going up, the pressure going up. As the pressure goes up, the regression rate goes up. And so solids have a tendency to increase the thrust over, over time. If you're in a rocket which is getting lighter, that means you're accelerating the payload. And it's very easy to over-accelerate the payload. So hybrids have this sort of benign feature to the, uh, to the, to the way they naturally behave in terms of thrust. This is the data from uh, the, the blue points here are the Stanford data that Arif measured in his PhD thesis. The red points are the points that we measured with our friends out at NASA Ames. And indeed, as we scaled up to fluxes that are comparable to what one would find in a large commercial system, um, the uh, regression rate that we were seeing, that increase <coughs> did hold. And in fact, dovetailed nicely with the small scale experiments, which tells us that we can design these things uh, in a laboratory. That is, we can design the fuels and expect that they'll perform uh, the, the way we measured them when we 
scale them up. This is, this is a typical specific impulse versus OF curve for liquid oxygen burning with paraffin uh, compared with HTPB, which is the, a common solid rocket binder. And you can see that these perform the performance is, of course, up uh, where it should be. In fact, it's a little higher because the paraffin is, as I said, a fully saturated hydrocarbon. One of the things you can do with solid fuels is you can add things to them. You can add, in this case, uh, metal, aluminum. So you can put in metal powder. And uh, this is actually aluminum uh, added to paraffin. And it's burning with nitrogen N2O4, nitrogen tetroxide, the stuff that I used to chase out at uh, the Manned Spacecraft Center. And what's interesting about doing that is you get a little bit of an increase in the performance, that is the specific impulse. But more interestingly, you get a dramatic decrease, get my thing going here, dramatic decrease in the OF ratio. So the specific impulse peaks at a lower O to F. That means that you can reduce the volume of liquid required for the system. What's that? It's oxidizer mass flow to fuel mass flow. And if you can reduce that, that means you're, you're trading a more dense, a more dense fuel for a less dense oxidizer and reducing the size of the liquid feed system. So to a designer, that's a very desirable feature to be able to do that. Uh, I should say some of these other things. Uh, UDMH, unsymmetrical dimethyl hydrazine burning with N2O4. That's a common hypergolic bipropellant system. IUS refers to the inertial upper stage. I don't know if you remember when the shuttle used to take upper stage motors and launch them out of the payload bay. Quite often it was the IUS motor that was on that satellite that was going to go into a, another orbit. So we've done, a lot of we've done a lot of this over the years. We've, I, I've got 800 up here, but it's probably over that by now, uh, with a whole variety of different scales. This is the experiments in the lab at Stanford. This is some experiments we did early on with nitrous oxide down in Miami. Um, this is uh, NASA Ames. This is a first liquid oxygen test out in New Mexico. This is a test up in uh, Tillamook, Oregon. And we, the, the, the company that a reef runs has a facility now up in Butte, Montana, where they do a lot of, of their motor testing up near a place called Silverbow. Well, once you've solved the regression rate problem, you've got two other problems you start to face, the stability problem. And you can see here in the upper left uh, a typical hybrid rocket motor with low frequency instability. Uh, NASA developed an HPDP motor, Hybrid Propulsion Demonstrator motor, some years ago in the 90s and early 2000s. 250,000 pound thrust motor using liquid oxygen as the oxidizer, and almost all of their tests look like that. And that's because hybrids are subject to low frequency instabilities. They arise from different things. They arise actually from the physics of the uh, the melting process. There's uh, delays associated with the penetration of heat into the fuel grain. Um, there are also, um, it's very easy to get injector instabilities uh, associated with not having the proper delta P across the injector. Um, there's a whole variety of things uh, that can lead to this, but you have to fight this and ultimately design the motor and try to understand the cause of these things and get rid of it. Well, once you get rid of the low frequency instability, which is done in the next plot, then you get an acoustic instability. So now we have the rocket acting like, actually like a closed pipe with an acoustic wave going back and forth. It's not really closed because it's got a throat, but it's almost closed because the area ratio is pretty large. And so you have now the long, first longitudinal mode popping up. And if you get rid of this, you get the second longitudinal mode popping up. And you have to learn how to absorb this noise inside the motor, get rid of it. Well. You can see the amplitude from 400 to 600 psi. That's, there's an enormous amount of acoustic energy in that that you have to take out. Ultimately, we've been able to figure out how to do that. And this is an example of a nice, stable LOX paraffin hybrid. And uh, people talk about combustion efficiency. Uh, and the combustion efficiency, so-called C-star efficiency, is basically a measure of how well you're doing at completely burning all the paraffin 
with the right amount of oxygen. Uh, this particular motor, a reef's got greater than 95 percent, but uh, closer to 98 percent is what they're commonly getting these days. So it's now possible to design a liquid oxygen paraffin hybrid rocket with 98 percent sea star efficiency and good stability. Well, if you compare that with other motors that are out there, it's pretty interesting. If you go back to the Apollo program and look at the F-1 engine that was built by Rocketdyne for the Saturn V, I've done a little comparison here. Let's look first at the chamber pressure. So we have the F-1 engine at about 1,030 psi. The RD-180, which is the, the, the highest performing kerosene or hydrocarbon LOX engine, liquid oxygen engine in the world, operating at almost 4,000 psi. The Merlin vacuum, which is built by, uh, by SpaceX, running at about 890 psi. And then I'll show you the results here of a test motor using paraffin and LOX up at Butte, running at about 500 psi. Now, these all are designed to different area ratios, 16 to 1. This is a, these are first stage engines. Uh, the Merlin vacuum is really an upper stage. It's a, it's a space engine with 170 to 1 area ratio. If you extrapolate back to a 70 to 1 area ratio, then these are the ISPs. Now, ISP is specific impulse, but multiply by G, multiply by 9.8, that's the effective exhaust velocity. So 307 for the F1, which is not very good. The F1 engine actually didn't perform very well. In fact, it barely worked. Um, it was an unstable engine and, in fact, had to really operate at an OF ratio, which was way off peak. So they operated very fuel rich, both to keep the engine from burning up and also to make it stable. 307 seconds for if it were, if it had a 70 to 1 uh, nozzle on it. If you look at the RD-180, ah. so the RD-180 is the next one down here, that one, at 350. That's the highest performing engine in the world, right there. The, the Merlin vacuum at 334, it's advertised at 342, but if you extrapolate back to a 70 to 1 area ratio, it's about 334. And the engine that you see depicted here being tested up in Butte runs at about 340. So these engines now are beginning to get performance comparable to the highest performing engines in the world. Now, I ha have to recognize this is a performance that's, that's measured. You know, we can measure the C star efficiency and assume a nozzle and we get 340. But this is an engine that operates as a test engine. It's not yet a, um, an, uh, let's say, a, uh, uh, an engine you can uh, manufacture in, at high rates. It's a heavy engine. Um, it's basically a design that you can uh, uh, produce fairly easily because it's a hybrid. You can make it out of composite materials. Um, but uh, it's uh, uh, still not quite ready to be uh, used in large numbers. The reason for that is that the test times still are very short. These are five to ten second tests. This engine that you see on the right has to be tested up to maybe a hundred seconds or something like that to really confirm that you can hold that level of performance over the whole burn time. But it's getting pretty close. Um, <coughs> Let me just give you a quick uh, introduction to an alternate oxidizer. When you, when you use paraffin, you're using a very benign material. It's easy to use. You can, you can have it around the lab. You can do anything you want with it. You can remelt it and reuse it uh, if you haven't burned it. But the oxidizers tend to be kind of nasty. Liquid oxygen is a cryogen. Um, nitrous oxide by itself is a commonly used oxidizer, but it can self-decompose and has hazards associated with it. Hydrogen peroxide also self-decomposes much more readily than nitrous oxide. N2O4, very nasty. Uh, red fuming nitric acid, we don't need to even go there. So oxidizers tend to be nasty. So we've been looking, actually, at 
a class of oxidizers that involve mixtures of oxygen and nitrous oxide. Now, the benefit of nitrous oxide is that at room temperature, nitrous oxide is a liquid with a very high vapor pressure. So it's a self-pressurizing <coughs> oxidizer, which is very convenient. On the other hand, the density is only about 7 tenths that of water, so it's not very dense. However, if you take nitrous oxide and you cool it down to about minus 60, minus 70, something like that, it's freezing temperatures around minus 80. If you cool it, uh, you can increase the density to about 1.2 times water. So the liquid density goes way up when it's cooled. If you now pressurize that with oxygen, gaseous oxygen, at those temperatures, you can dissolve quite a bit of oxygen in the nitrous oxide. So you, and in fact, you can bring the pressure of the system back up to a rather high pressure over that mixture. So now you have a self-pressurizing oxidizer back with quite a bit better performance than simple nitrous oxide by itself, both in terms of the density and also in terms of specific impulse. This is sort of the, this is the picture that goes with that description. This is the liquid density on the left versus pressure. Nitrous oxide by itself is the red line that you can see there. And you can see that at room temperature, you're operating at relatively low density. If you cool it, the density follows this path. It actually is more dense than liquid oxygen when it gets to very low temperatures. It's low temperatures. LOX is on here too. And if you take LOX, which is liquid at minus 183 and a density of about a little less than 1.2, if you, if you wanted to use LOX as a self-pressurized oxidizer, uh, this plot tells you that that basically won't work. And the reason it won't work is that as you try to raise the temperature of the LOX and raise its vapor pressure, its density goes down. And so you wouldn't be able to really use liquid oxygen as a self-pressurizing oxidizer. Now, if you take nitrous oxide, and you begin to add oxygen to it, instead of following this line, you, if you keep the temperature constant, say at minus 60 C, you actually follow a line that looks like this. You're adding a more volatile material, so the density is going down some, but not very much. And you're up over here at 80, 90 atmospheres. So you have this opportunity for what is basically a very benign oxidizer, nitrox, which is nitrous oxide and oxygen, is in fact very similar to what you would get if you went to a, uh, had surgery and they gave you laughing gas. This is basically laughing gas. And in fact, most of the data that you see here in these plots is data that came out of the anesthesia literature. Anesthesiologists studied this stuff very carefully because initially they tried mixing these two things together and feeding them to patients. But what happens is the oxygen comes out quickly and then you have nothing but nitrous oxide coming out, and the patient can suffocate. So what they do now uh, with laughing gas is you actually uh, bring the nitrous oxide and the oxygen together on, uh, on the fly as you feed it to a patient for breathing. But this is a very benign material to be around. It's uh, 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 much safer than most oxidizers, and it gives pretty good performance. Uh, let me just sort of get to the performance quickly. So here is specific impulse versus O to F ratio. And I've got these various blue curves, which represent nitrox at different temperatures. And the, the light blue here is uh, N2O4, which is a common oxidizer and is nasty. And you can see that if you get the right percentage of oxygen, you can improve over the performance of N2O4. So this is an oxidizer that could replace N2O4 and um, get pretty good performance. Here's an example now of a system comparison. These are, uh, this is a GEM40 uh, graphite epoxy motor. It's an ATK solid rocket booster. Uh, if you've seen these strap-on boosters on launch vehicles, uh, this is the GEM40 is a common one. GEM60 is the next size up. The 40 refers to the 40-inch diameter of the motor. And we've, we've actually compared it with a nitrox 80. That's minus 80 degrees C with a 20% aluminum and paraffin 
and then plain locks with paraffin. The total impulse is kept the same. The outside diameter of the rocket is kept the same. The burn time is kept the same. And you can see that the, the hybrid is longer. The GEM-40 is 13 meters long. The hybrid is 18 or 19. The reason, of course, is you're dealing with the same total impulse but less dense propellants. These solid propellants uh, have densities that are typically twice water or more. The propulsion system mass, however, is almost the same. And in fact, the lightest here is the nitrox aluminum paraffin. <coughs> well, this is a motor then that could completely replace a GEM-40, but does not have any of the hazards associated with solid rockets and would be far less expensive to actually manufacture. So that looks to us like a uh, system that uh, could be a real winner. Uh, let me just look at one more thing, our Mars Ascent Vehicle. So this is the mission out to Mars to collect a sample. The, the samples actually remain on the surface of Mars and there's another vehicle that comes out, grabs a sample, takes it to orbit, another vehicle comes out, takes it home. So the Mars Ascent Vehicle, it's a challenging problem because the Mars Ascent Vehicle has to sit in the Mars environment for a long period of time, maybe 18 months. So you're dealing with a set of propellants that, let me just, uh, I thought I had the, I don't have that picture. You're dealing with a set of propellants that have to withstand repeated cycles of the Mars, atmosphere, Mars temperature, basically. And solid propellants generally are not very good if they have to be cycled to very low temperatures and back up because they become brittle, you go through a glass transition, uh, over a large number of cycles, you can develop cracks. Paraffin is actually more like a metal. It's not a polymer. It's a material that really does not have any significant glass transition. And nitrox that I just described has a, a solidification temperature which is at the very low end of the Mars temperature range. So that combination looked to us like a, a system that you could put out on Mars and not require a thermal igloo to keep the whole thing temperature conditioned. Uh, we talked about the effect of adding aluminum, which can really improve both performance and uh, the amount of liquid required. One of the interesting things about the hybrid for this uh, task is that if you use nitrox as the oxidizer and you pressurize with oxygen, when you go from the liquid phase going through an injector gasifying to gas going through the injector gasifying, the mass flow rate goes down quite a bit, uh, and the OF shifts. And if, and, but the OF shifts from 3.7 to 2.2, which happens to put it in just the right range. In other words, 3.7 is good for nitrox, 2.2 is good for pure oxygen burning with paraffin. So you can maintain combustion and actually use up all of the pressurant as propellant. And anybody who's designed pressure-fed liquid rockets would immediately recognize that oftentimes it's the it's the size and weight of the pressurization system, the pressurant, that can really drive the design. So this is a, a good advantage of the hybrid. Well, when we make a comparison uh, with the two-stage solid, which was kind of the, the baseline, the mass is 351 kilograms, a f margin of 40% on our hybrid, we end up with 273. If we reduce the margin to 20%, like the solid, it's about 248. So in this case, we think the paraffin with nitrox uh, really would be a much lighter design than the current concepts for the Mars Ascent vehicle. Um, I think actually this, well, I think it's probably a good time to stop because I, I, we're stopping at one, are we? Yeah, so let, let me just run uh, this video for you real quickly and I'll be uh, happy to take questions. If you want to see more videos, anybody wants to stay around, I'd be glad to do that. But let's take a look at uh, a project that we uh, did with our students. So we have a propulsion design project that we uh, do every year with our graduate students. And this is actually one of the first ones uh, with a group of students. In fact, this might have been actually the first year we ran that course. And so they designed and built their
and taking, because in fact the parachute didn't deploy properly. It was supposed to deploy a drogue chute first and fall quite a ways and then a larger chute so it didn't fall so far away. But what you saw coming out were both chutes at the same time. And so it, from 15,000 feet it just drifted five miles. And the reason I think the camera was an accident is that on the camera, on the videotape, there was no footage prior to launch. So they reached in there and they pressed the buttons thinking they're starting the camera. But I don't think they did. I think the camera started itself when it launched and it got the video. <laughs> so it's just luck. <laughs> and we'll stop there. I'll, I'll kick off with another question, Brian. Um, so when can we expect to uh, see uh, commercial hybrids coming out? That's a really good question. So right now, the testing that's going, up, uh, uh, going on up in Butte is of a 24-inch motor. It's about this big, uh, which would be uh, designed for an upper stage. And so we actually have a commercially available motor, which is a 10-inch motor now. And uh, not sure where that might first come up. It, it, there are all kinds of crazy people out there who want to go faster than 1,000 miles an hour on land. Okay. So one of the, <laughs> there's one effort called Jet Black, which is from New Zealand. And they want three of these motors to allow them to go over a thousand miles an hour. So that's one possible place. Um, but I think the, uh, the first real large scale commercial use would be of an upper stage. And I'd say that's, that motor's probably a year away. And then, it really, at this point, we're looking for a customer for that motor. Now, there is one customer up in Oregon who wants to launch small satellites. And this is where we think this technology really could play a big role. We want to get into space for low cost, somehow. Hybrids have the potential for really lowering the cost. So there's a group up in Oregon that actually wants to develop an air-launched um, sat small satellite launch system and uh, using our propulsion system. So that also, I would say, is it's hard to say because I don't know if they've got all their money together. They're trying to put together the money. But once they've got the money, it's probably a 18 months to two years. Right. I have a question about uh, during the burning of one of these uh, rockets. Does the oxidizer to fuel ratio increase as it burns because suddenly you're Expanding it, the port size. It does. Uh, there is a tendency for the O to F ratio to creep upward, and uh, so when you, uh, and it, if it's a uh, nitrous oxide as the oxidizer, the N exponent is about a half. There's no O F shift. With paraffin and LOX, the exponent is about point about point six two, so there's a small O F shift over the course of the burn. And the, when you optimize a design, you actually start a little bit to the left of the peak specific impulse. And as the burn pr proceeds, you end up toward the peak at the very end of the burn when you have the highest propulsive efficiency. So that's, that's a design issue that you address. But it's a relatively small change in the OF, not very large. Yes. So I, I've read uh, one disadvantage of uh, the paraffin, using pure paraffin, is that you have this radiative heat transfer from the burning surface that uh, ends up heating the paraffin too deeply, too quickly, and ends up kind of melting it prematurely. Yeah. Do you guys have to put anything in there to yes. sort of absorb that and keep the yes. heat right very, on the surface? Very important to have a blackener, just as, there is, just as you do in solid rocket fuel. Solid rocket propellants require a blackener for a similar reason. You don't allow heat into the deep into the surface of the propellant, because if you do, in a solid propellant, you can exceed the detonation temperature and blow up the propellant. Hybrids, you blacken it to do just that. You want all the heat deposited at the surface and as little as possible to penetrate into the paraffin. Now, you're sweeping the surface away all the time. So in fact, that thermal layer that develops in paraffin with a proper blackener is extremely thin. It's not actually an issue, uh, but people who've tried when people have tried this using paraffins that are either too low molecular weight or occasionally not fully refined, it's very important that it be a fully refined wax, meaning no oils. So the wax we use has a carbon number of 32. It would be, it's very similar to what people sometimes call hurricane wax, 
or sculptor's wax. If you go down here to Salve, you'll find these people who make figures out of wax. It's a very similar grade of wax to that. It's just a few percent of blackness? Yeah, it's not very much at all. Yeah, yeah I <coughs> today's maybe the first time in my life I've wanted to be a structural engineer. <laughs> um, because looking at the, the, gra uh, the charts you have, um, it looks like your uh, burn chamber pressure is like way less than the alternatives. Does yeah. that have a significant structural sort of fallout, a lighter structure that you can use? Yeah, it's use? a dramatically lighter structure. That, that 500 PSI, and, and if you, in fact, the motor we're testing out of Butte now, which is designed to be an upper stage, really a space motor, that optimizes out at about 200 PSI. So upper stage motors, uh, vacuum motors, tend to be lower pressures. Uh, but we've run these fuels at over 1,000. The Ames tests we did, uh, uh, chamber pressure's up over 1,100. The propellant itself, the fuel, actually hangs together very well. We worried a lot about whether it would crack and break, and it will if you don't uh, design it carefully. So if you put ordinary wax into a, like this hurricane wax, and you mold it, and you put it in a motor case, a flight weight motor case, and you pressurize it, it'll expand and will crack. So you do have to add structural materials to the paraffin to make sure that it, it doesn't do that and to give it a bit of elongation capability. That's why solid propellants were rubberized, was because they couldn't get these things, they couldn't pack them together and have them not crack. So. Uh, what is your current uh, thrust levels for the rockets you've developed and do you have, what plans do you have for increasing, yeah. uh, getting the, larger rockets? The 10-inch motor I mentioned earlier is about a 6,000-pound thrust motor. The 22-inch uh, motor uh, is a 24,000-pound thrust class motor. Uh, we're also working with Greg Ziliak out of NASA Ames on a sounding rocket project that's called Peregrine. And that motor is about a 12 to 14,000 pound class motor. The project that we've been on with the Air Force to develop these larger scale motors, the next size up would be a 50 inch motor. Uh, and that actually would be a replacement for a GEM 60, which is a strap on booster. And that's, that would be a 250,000 pound thrust motor. So that's in the future. And that depends, of course, on funding. What did your student experiment prove? Well, it proved that they could uh, design and build this thing and actually get it to work. I think that's probably the most important thing. But they also proved that they could get back the GPS signal. Um, we, we had a group at Stanford doing a lot of satellite work. And they would go up to Black Rock and launch satellites off of rockets. And they had a great deal of difficulty getting the signal back because Black Rock is a very sort of absorbent surface. And we were able to get, uh, we had a member of our student team actually who uh, was the antenna designer, who designed the antenna to bring back the GPS signal. So that was probably their biggest accomplishment. Well, if you have any more questions, I encourage you to come up and, 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 and speak to Brian. Brian, we have a special uh, paraffin wax container <laughs> there um, <laughs> right. that you can use. Are we alone? <laughs> yes, please join me in thanking Brian for his great talk.